Hello and welcome back to The Drag Detective, where today we are going to be going through every runner-up on the American regular version of Drag Race, and we're going to kind of go over some of the reasons why I don't think they won the crown. Now, I can honestly just be like, oh, well, they lost because, well, the queen who won was just better, or had a better track record, or da da da, -da. but we're going to really dive into why these queens specifically lost. What was it that led to them not winning? Because as we know, at this point in Drag Race, it's not about track record. It's not about necessarily audience approval. There's a lot of factors that go in from a production standpoint. And, you know, for VH1 or World of Wonder or, you know, all the little people that are getting their little fingers involved and saying, we, we, want, we need this or we want this or we want this. There's a lot of factors. And I think specifically with a lot of these queens, there's very specific reasons why they didn't win. So this is just my opinion. This is just how I see it as, you know, looking from the production standpoint, like I usually do. But we're going to dive into each one. Do you know how easy it is to submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan? Morgan & Morgan is a 21st century law firm and they have modernize the injury law process, which means that you can submit a claim and talk to your legal team all through your phone. And with eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan. I could do it while sitting through one of the many commercial breaks while watching Drag Race, or while waiting for a video to export, or while waiting for my DoorDash to show up. You get the picture. With Morgan & Morgan, you can submit a claim without ever having to leave the couch. If you're injured and don't know where to start, with Morgan & Morgan, it is so easy. Now, there's a few things that you need to do if you're ever involved in an accident. One, make sure you're okay. Two, get a police report. Three, contact your insurance. And four, get legal representation. And with Morgan & Morgan, that last step has never been easier. With just eight clicks or less, you can have America's largest injury law firm fighting for you. You can get started at forthepeople.com slash drag detective or dial pound law, that's pound 529 from your phone. Thank you so much to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring today's video. Now, I just want to be clear that for a queen to be considered a runner-up in my book, it's not necessarily a finalist or someone who makes the finale, but it's who is standing there when RuPaul is saying the winner of Drag Race season, whatever America's Next Drag Superstar is. So whether that's three queens or two queens, who is standing there potentially getting a crown on their head. And starting the list off will be season one's runner-up, Nina Flowers. Now, this one I think is very easy to explain. I've talked about this a couple times on the channel, but the final two that we have are Bibi Zahara Benet and Nina Flowers. Bibi Zahara Benet obviously gets the crown in the end, but I think this was for a very specific example because, like, realistically, they both did pretty well throughout the competition. They both had weeks where they didn't shine. They both had weeks where they did really shine. BB, I think, had two wins and Nina had one. So it really wasn't like a huge, vast difference between their track records. Nina was in the top a lot, whereas BB was safe a lot in the beginning of the season. I really think this just comes down to this being the first season on a very small channel and for it being 2009, 2008 when it was filmed, it was a very different time, <laughs> honestly. And I think that they wanted the first queen who was going to be announced as America's Next Drag Superstar. Someone palatable to the audience. Someone who wasn't going to be seen as avant-garde or like outside of the box or like doing things that are outside of the realm of RuPaul because really that is the selling point of this season because at this point in season one RuPaul was the number one drag queen in America probably in the world the most well known and to usher in a new era of drag artists picking someone like Nina who has a very avant-garde you know weird out of the box approach to drag isn't as palatable as someone like BB, who is more in the vein of what RuPaul is known for, you know, very feminine. You know what you would say at the time is like average drag. It's not going outside of the box. It's not going outside of the parameters of what America at the time knew as this is a drag queen. And at that point, a drag queen was someone who put on a wig, put on a dress, put on some fake boobs, and, you know, went and lip synced. And, you know, you know, we've seen queens push the envelope more than Nina in season since, but for that time period of drag and, and drag race, Nina Flowers was doing things that weren't necessarily what a person would expect a drag queen to be doing. And I think for the time and for it being the first season, they wanted to play it safe. And playing it safe meant 
B.B. Zaharbonnet is winning. Season two is Raven. She is our runner up to Tyra Sanchez, who won The Crown. And this is, I would say probably to this day, still one of the most controversial top twos the show has ever seen because neither of them were portrayed as like professional necessarily. You know, you have Tyra being hated on by, you know, most of the queens for half the season. You have Raven in the confessional talking shit on, you know, most of the queens throughout the season. So for this to be the final two, I think that there's definitely pros and cons to, to each. You know, Raven is definitely more palatable, I guess, from the stance that she got along with more queens than Tyra did. But at the same time, she struggled more in the competition than Tyra did. But then Tyra, on the other hand, did really well throughout the entire competition, the entire season. But she also ran into lots of issues with other queens, whereas Ravens were more behind the camera, which is like why that exposed moment at the reunion when they're showing all the things she was saying is really like, oh, damn. OK, so I think it comes down to Raven struggled a lot in the beginning of the season. Now, by the end, she was doing really well. She was winning challenges. She was being in the top a lot. Her runways were really great. Her lip syncs were really great. She was the full package, but so was Tyra. And I think it's one of those cases where it it does come down to the final lip sync, potentially the final runway, that final episode. And back then they weren't watching what the audience was thinking. They were just crowning whoever they wanted to at that time. They weren't gonna you know, record both of them winning, see what the audience thinks and then pick a winner. This was like, we chose right on the spot. And I honestly think Raven lost because of that last lip sync. I think Tyra really, really did a great job. And for these early seasons, there's not a ton more to go off of rather than performance and, you know, track record. And I think in both those factors, Tyra kind of schooled Raven. <laughs> That's the only one I think that I can really not factor in any other circumstances other than just the competition itself. Season three, we have Manila Luzon. Now, why did Manila lose? She and Raja had exact track records when it came to their dusted or busted scores. They really were very close the entire season. They both had a moment where they flopped and were in the bottom, but then they each gave an iconic lip sync performance to kind of bounce back immediately from that. They both had incredible runways. They were pushing what the art form of drag could look like on television. And I truly to this day think this is the closest top two we have ever had. I think Manila loses because Raja just has more cachet on her name. She has better relationships with WOW and with Rue. And when they're going to be picking a winner like this back then, they want someone who is going to carry the show. And for that year that they're wearing the crown and they're the most recent winner, they want them to be out there doing the most. And that's not just for these early seasons. That's for, you know, recent seasons as well. But there's just not as much to go on in those early seasons. So I think that really meant more. And for Raja, who is such a huge name in drag since, you know, the early 2000s, I you know she's already been on Top Model and all of these things. I just, I think that's the little bit of edge that gave her the win over Manila, who, you know, was doing so well and had proved herself to be, you know, a great competitor on season three. But outside of the show, she just, her name didn't have as much weight behind it as Raja's did. So now we're going to look at season four. There were two runners up for the first time in Drag Race history, and this was the first time that they filmed everyone winning. So this is in front of the live studio audience. Everyone got a chance to win, and so that makes the decision definitely more impacted by what actually happened on the season and what the audience is seeing happen on the season. So this is also kind of ushering in the era where they could edit queens a certain way to get the reaction from the audience that they wanted. So did they want the winner of season four to win? I really think they did because she was pushing boundaries and she was kind of pinned as the underdog of the season because she was doing so many different things and pushing her drag in areas we haven't seen on the show before. And so specifically looking at Jeremy Carey, formerly known as Fifi O'Hara, in the classic hero and villain narrative, the villain can never come out on top. That's just not a satisfying ending. And for this entire season to kind of be about the push and pull of Fifi and Sharon, for Fifi to win in the end would have been an unsatisfying conclusion based on the edit that we saw. And for Chad, 
you know, we see her kind of as the first queen to get that professional edit where, like, you're such a professional. You know, you, you're so professional at everything you do, but you're not pushing yourself out of that realm. We want to see you get down and dirty. You know, she was, like, the first queen who really got that consistent critique. And, I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves, <laughs> even if we're not fond of who they are as a human, what the winner of season four did was exciting. It was pushing the boundaries. It was entertaining television. And what Chad was doing was classic drag, done well, done right. But it did kind of lack that edge that the eventual winner did have in their drag. So when you're comparing the two, it's kind of like, okay, are we going to award someone with something we've seen before? And yes, it is done right, and it is done well, and it is done, you know, as only Chad can do it. Or this new thing that is exciting and it's different and it's pushing the boundaries of, of what you expect to see, one, from a drag artist, and two, on your television. So I do think that in this case, just kind of like with Raja, they were pushing what we would expect from a drag artist on our television screen by crowning who they did. And by crowning Chad, that's not that's not the narrative of the season. That's not what you're leaving with. You're kind of leaving with, oh, that is a fantastic drag queen. They won the season, you know, cool. Whereas the person that they picked, I think really pushed the show into an entirely new direction. And I think because of that is why we still have this show around and why it is as big as it is. Because they took those risks. They saw that what the audience was responding to was this different style of drag, not the style that we have come to know and come to love when we go out to bars and what we see on the show. But I think that is why Chad Michaels lost. And because she lost and the winner won, now we can go into future seasons and have, they that can win other seasons because we've seen different styles now win two times in a row. So moving on to season five, and you know, I think that specifically four and five are very different examples because of the seasons, and honestly seven, seven two, they're kind of their own thing because they had these season-long narratives where the queens involved in these season-long narratives all make it to the end. And it's up to the audience then to pick a side. And in season four's case, audience, whoever they sided with, won. In season five's case, who the audience sided with, won. We'll see it again in season seven. So that's why Jinx won. Why did Alaska and Roxy lose? Roxy lost for the same reason that Fifi lost, because they're never going to award a, a villain, which is what we saw in the edit. That was a villain that they have, you know, edited together for our television viewing experience. They're never going to award that queen with the crown. For Alaska, you know, I think that Alaska came in with a very specific storyline, which was, I am dating the former winner of last season, how can I stand out? How can I live up to all this hype and all of this pressure that is, you know, surrounding me? And, you know, I talk about, like, growth arcs. You know, they talk about this a lot on Survivor. If you get a certain edit, you can win by not winning. And I think that's what happened to Alaska here. Because she came in, and I think she set out to do everything that she could have, which was... I want to, you know, show the world my drag. I want to show that I'm not just in, you know, Sharon's shadow, that I am my own queen, that I deserve a chance on this show, and I'm not just getting the chance because I'm dating a winner. And, you know, all of those things she did. So she doesn't need a crown on top of that because that's not her story. Her story isn't about I'm here to win the crown. Her story was I'm here to show that I'm not just in the shadow of my boyfriend. And, and she did that. Whereas, you know, Jinx's story was I want to overcome these bullies and by doing that you need to win the crown which is why Jinx won the crown. Okay season six we have Courtney Act and Adore Delano. Let's talk about Courtney Act because of the you know final three she had the least amount of chance of winning because it was so close between Adore and Bianca that they actually filmed a double crowning between the two of them. So why not Courtney? You know, I don't think she necessarily had a villain edit like we saw with Roxy and with Fifi, but she definitely got a lot of shady content. I think that, you know, watching season six of Drag Race, and if you're not watching anything else of Courtney Act, any of her interviews, any of the other appearances she's made on television, I think you get a very different picture of who Courtney is. And I think it's not as pleasant as who Courtney really is. So I think, like, to the lesser extent, the edit that we saw of Courtney was not an edit of someone you're going to give a crown to. Whereas Adore kind of gets a different version of 
the jinx edit where you know she comes in she is underappreciated she is underestimated and throughout the season she has these obstacles that she has to overcome to prove herself worthy of winning so i think that is kind of where you would you know see adore as a potential winner why they would film a double crowning but i think what falls flat in adore's story versus bianca's is the room for growth that is still obviously there you know i think adore through her fashion through what you know michelle was constantly critiquing on her she was a great drag artist but she wasn't the complete version of what she was going to be and i think that is where she kind of falls flat where we're looking at bianca del rio we're looking at peak bianca bianca is doing the best at what she does when it comes to the comedy when it comes to the makeup when the looks and the personality all of the things that bianca is doing is peak Bianca. Adore is still young. She's still figuring things out with, you know, her fashion and who she wants to be as as a drag artist. I think that was pretty prevalent watching the show. So that's why I think Adore was a great All-Stars candidate because, you know, she can come back and say, this is what I've learned about myself and this is what I've been doing and growing, um, you know, with myself since. Now I'm ready for the crown. And I think that's why it goes to Bianca instead of Adore. Season seven, we have Pearl and Ginger who both lose. And, you know, I think that Pearl is kind of the example of the person that they want to hold the crown for the next year is someone that they want to be touring the world and doing interviews and making appearances at places. And at this point, with what Pearl showed on the show, it didn't seem like, and not saying she wasn't able, but the edit wasn't showing us that she was capable of all of that you know the, the edit bonked us over the head a million times that pearl is very low energy that pearl is somewhat unprofessional and that pearl is flase da i mean that's the perfect <laughs> you know representation of pearl on season seven that's not someone that you can go throw on a morning show to talk to and they're gonna be like bringing interest to the show whereas someone like ginger or violet they have those personalities that are infectious that are you know gonna bring people to shows and, and things like that. I think that's what was holding Pearl back a little bit uh, on season seven. Now for Ginger, this is fully the Roxy Andrews, the Fifi O'Hara villain edit, you are no way winning when you are perceived by the audience as the villain. And, you know, I think for the first three-fourths of the season, it was Violet and Ginger and Kennedy, and they were each, you know, giving reasons why they are the villain of the season. But then we see towards the back half, that Pearl and Violet really grow as, as people and, you know, they're realizing things about themselves and they're trying to be better about, you know, how they treat people around them and how they're, you know, perceived by the people around them. Whereas Ginger and Kennedy just kind of double down on the, you know, the cattiness that had been visible throughout the whole season. So especially those last two episodes, Ginger does not come off looking fantastic. Whereas Violet comes off as looking like she's had a lot of growth personally and in her drag and in how she wants to be perceived by the audience. So that is where Ginger, I think, immediately loses. Once you lose the audience's side, once the audience is like, I'm not on your side, I'm on Violet's side, you're not winning. Season eight, we have Naomi Smalls and Kimchi. Let's start with Naomi. And I think that Naomi, unfortunately, gets a little bit overshadowed throughout season eight when it comes to just, you know, challenge performance and when it comes to the edit. You know, she was not the most visible queen on that season or, you know, even close to the most visible on that season. She only really flourishes in the edit when a lot of the louder, more entertaining queens like, you know, Thorgy and Acid Betty and Robbie Turner are all gone. That's when Naomi really starts to have a presence in the episodes. So I think that is definitely what hurt her, especially on a season with so many huge personalities. I mean, this really felt like a two horse race, you know, at the end of the season between Kimchi and Bob. And you know, why Kimchi lost is, you know, I think looking at that last finale, I think going into the finale, they both are very close in, in you know, who's gonna win. And I think that Bob just showed more growth in the areas where she needed it than Kim did. You know, Bob's main critique the entire season was the runway. And Bob's looks in that finale were amazing, incredible. You know, she showed that she was able to push her style to new highs. And Kim Chi's main critique all season was 
her performance ability. And there wasn't much growth in that as what we saw in the finale. So I think that is kind of where Bob pushes ahead a little tiny bit. But I still think it was very close between Bob and Kimchi because I think the fandom was split. I think that they would both have been a great mantle for the show for the next year as, you know, the, the current reigning. So I think it was very close, but that one little detail is what kind of pushes Bob ahead. Okay, now we're up to season nine. We're in the VH1 era, and I think that things get a lot different once we get here because the finales are different, the format of the finales are different, and the audience is so much bigger that I think it changes everything. So first we have Peppermint, who is the runner-up of season nine. You know, I think that in this case, it does, because of the lip sync finales, it does come down more to performance than it did before. You know, if there was a close performance where both people felt like they could have won, which we'll get to in a couple seasons, there are other factors that come in. But in season nine specifically, Peppermint lost because she was up against Sasha Valore, and Sasha Valore just made one of the greatest moments of all time on the show literally 20 minutes earlier. So not only that, but Sasha had a better track record. Sasha had, you know, more fan backing for the crown than Peppermint did. So I really think it all just comes down to Sasha was a better candidate at that point for multiple reasons than Peppermint. Season 10, we have both Eureka and Cameron Michaels. Cameron, I think, is very similar to Pearl, where Cameron was kind of absent for a lot of the season. She was very low energy. That's kind of her main critique, is that she was just very chill and lax, and she didn't let her personality shine, because um, apparently being chill is not a personality. <laughs> so I think that definitely is all going against her as someone who, you know, wow, is going to have touring the world as the winner doing interviews, doing all these things, can Cameron keep up with all of that when it comes to her personality, when it comes to being on camera and being, like, you know, on? And then, you know, her character gets basically assassinated in the reunion right before the finale the next week. So not only do we have these other issues, but now all the queens are saying Cameron's a bitch, Cameron is fake. That is not, you know, the kind of momentum you want going into a finale. So I think it was over for Cameron, you know, before that finale even started airing. Now Eureka, on the other hand, I think was the, the bigger competition to Aquaria. I really think it comes down to, we'll talk about this later with Gigi Good. There were things going on outside of the show with Eureka. You know, she had some scandals. She had some controversies. She was kind of seen, you know, by the end of the season as poking the bear when it came to the vixen and wanting to start fights. And there was a lot of negativity surrounding the conversation about Eureka at the time. And I think that to crown someone who has had so many recent controversies is a big risk. I think there has to be very certain circumstances where they would ever do that. You know, it, the other three would need to literally like suck for them to crown someone who is involved as much as Eureka was at that time. So I think that's really where she loses it. Season 11. This one is very different because we have the top two performers of the entire season. Both were huge fan favorites, to, beloved by the fandom. Evie Oddly and Brooklyn Heights were the top two. Why does Brooke lose? I think because Evie had a better story as the winner. Brooke's main storyline throughout the whole season is you're the professional, a little bit like Chad Michaels. Now, Brooke was able to push out of this a little bit more by succeeding in, you know, comedy challenges and doing things that are way outside of her, her box to prove that she can do other stuff. But that's still kind of the narrative that was surrounding her. And then the other side was Vanjie and hers kind of little love story. Now that storyline ended when she sent Vanjie home. So going into a finale, Brooke doesn't have a story necessarily. She doesn't have a, you know, any kind of relationship with the other three that were in the final four. She doesn't have, you know, an, an ongoing narrative arc that is still proceeding. In kind of like with Cameron Michaels in that reunion, Brooke is made out to be the undercover villain of the season, if you will. So that is not looking good for her going into a finale. Like I said, there's no momentum. Whereas Evie Oddly had a lot of momentum. You know, she was constantly fighting with people left and right on her season. And I think for most of those fights, she comes out looking like the person who is in the right or like the victim, if you will, from the eyes of the fandom. So when you're going into a finale, where everyone is expecting a Silky versus Evie lip sync, finally, you know, this this rivalry coming to blows. 
that's a lot of momentum, <laughs> you know, going in. You're the underdog. You know, everyone here says, you know, two episodes later, you should have went home. So she had this momentum that I don't think Brooke did. And I think that's why Evie won. And also, she won that final lip sync. And they can, you know, say that someone else won a lip sync easily, like with Eureka and Aquaria the season prior. They can do whatever they want there. But when it came to that lip sync, like, Evie won it. So that's just more fuel to that fire of, like, why Brooke lost. Season 12, we have Crystal Method and Gigi Good. Now, Gigi, like I mentioned, kind of had some scandals going into this finale when it came to you know, her talking about politics and things like that. And this was, you know, 2020. This was a very, you know, major political time, which I, I think you could say about, like, everything post-2016. But 2016 was very, very high-tension political atmosphere. And for Gigi to be like, mm, I don't really care about politics, it, it felt very uh, tone-deaf for what the season was trying to push, which was, you know, this was, like, the big... We're talking about the issues. We are, you know, vying for this election in November. For her to kind of go against what was the main point of the season, what really felt like a, a sticking point for the season, which was politics, immediately that puts her in a weird spot. Specifically when you have Jada, who, you know, is talking about those issues and who is kind of giving us her side and, and her, you know, political message on the season. So that's one thing. Also, she got disqualified, basically, which... You know, everyone knows at this point, if you, you know, haven't heard about that, go watch my iceberg video. It's in that iceberg. So Gigi was out of the running, for sure. Crystal Method, I think it comes down to that last lip sync. I think she doesn't give much in that final lip sync. There is a world where Crystal Method wins the season. It's not like I could never see that happening. You know, obviously, I think Jada did a much stronger job overall on season 12 but crystal method was a huge fan favorite so i i wouldn't have been shocked if she won but i think in that final lip sync it she just doesn't push enough whereas jada destroyed that entire finale so it's kind of like how could you give it to anyone else at that point okay we're down to our last two both of the last two seasons have only had one runner up each so let's talk about candy muse on season 13. this one's hard because i think the fandom was split on whether candy muse was a villain or not so it wasn't like you know a fifi or a roxy or a ginger where like most people were like yes they're they're the villain candy had a lot of villainous edit moments at the beginning of the season but the whole back half of the season is showing us all of the other things about Candy and, you know, kind of fully rounding out her character on the television show. So by the end of the season, she isn't seen as villainous as she was at the beginning. But there were still plenty of people who were holding on to what they saw in the beginning and kind of, you know, throwing out all of the other, you know, great content that she was giving and just seeing her as one thing. So I think that's one reason. Second reason, she loses the final lip sync. Third reason is I think Simone just has that it factor. And I think that's why she's one of the queens who have done the most with their, you know, reigning year. She did so much. She was on late night talk shows and she was doing fashion weeks and, you know, walking runways, all of this stuff. Simone has that it factor. And Candy also has an it factor, but it just wasn't as definitive as Simone's was. And I don't know if she would have done as much as Simone did if she had won that crown. So I think that all of those factors kind of come together to where Simone definitely was winning that season against Candy Muse. And last up, we have a very... <sighs> this one's juicy because it's not obvious. It's not super like, oh, this is why. We have Lady Camden on season 14 who lost the crown to Willow Pill in the finale. Now, easy answer is she had a fumble in her last lip sync. She gets her crown stuck in her hair and she does something we've already seen her do before, which is the, you know, trip and fall and then, you know, wig reveal. Willow won that last lip sync, I think by a lot. But they were both such huge fan favorites. These were the top two fan favorites of this entire season, I think by the end of season 14. So if they wanted to, they could have easily cut that moment with Camden. They could have done something. If they wanted Camden to win, they could have made Camden win. You know what I mean? So why didn't they? I think it comes down to Camden still had room to grow. Looking at Willow's storyline on season 14 and Camden's storyline on season 14, Willow's storyline is, I'm a weirdo and you are all underestimating me because you're not getting what I'm doing. 
But once you get it and the people who do get it, you will see me as competition. And throughout the season, we see people start to come around and understand her perspective and understand what she's doing with her drag to where by the end of the season, she's one of the biggest competitors of the entire season. She has to be strategic. And we see that throughout, you know, the back half of the season to kind of do things that will lower her threat level. But that is her story. Whereas Lady Camden, her arc was, you're the quiet one. You're the one who's not coming out of your shell. You need to be giving more. We're not noticing you. And then once you finally do that, that's when you start slaying. And, you know, for the whole second half of the season, Lady Camden is slaying. But for the first, you know, five or six episodes, the story is you are not loud enough. You're not, you know, big enough. You need to go bigger. You need to show us that you want to be here. So while they both have really great arcs, Camden's is a growth arc, whereas Willow's was, you know, she never needed to grow from anything. She came in a superstar. She came in as a potential winner. And all she had to do was show other people why she was. So I think that is the main difference. And I think that is why Willow Pill wins in the end. So let me know what you think about this video. Let me know if you have any, you know, different thoughts, different opinions. And would you want to see me do this again with all-star seasons, with some international seasons? Let me know what you think. If you have not already, check out the newest episode of my podcast, The Rigged Recap, which is featuring both Niru and Amanda from Press Conference. So if you, you know, know them from Twitter, you know that it's probably going to be a chaotic episode, which it was in the best way possible. So that is live now on all streaming platforms where you listen to your music or your podcasts. And if you want to see video versions of that, they're all up and available on my Patreon. So I think that is all we have time for today. What do we think about this new filming setup? I kind of like this better than just like the random parts of my bedroom <laughs> where I picked before. So let me know what you think. Do you, we like the on-camera appearances or do you like just the disembodied voice? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And yeah, that is all we have time for. Here are the links to all of my social medias. And if you are not already, I would love for you to subscribe to the channel as we get into this back half of, you know, season 15, this, you know, these last few episodes. There will be a lot of season 15 content coming out. So make sure you subscribe so you do not miss it. Thank you all so much for watching and I will catch you all in the next one.